Today, we have the pleasure of having Professor Farrell Bromley from the Sorbonne University in Paris, and he's going to speak about uh, joint equidistribution of adelic torus orbits and families of twisted L functions. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I have to say it's, it's, it's a pleasure uh, for me uh, in this time to, uh, to uh, uh, attend online, online lectures and to give them just because the scientific interaction is so limited these days. Um, uh, if you have any questions, of course, uh, don't, be, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, so I'll be speaking on uh, some variants of uh, uh, a very popular question in um, analytic number theory and uh, ergodic theory, uh, uh, Linux problems. And so I'll start by, um, if I can, here we go, uh, uh, recalling some of the class, classical versions. So the first Linux problem uh, has to do with uh, primitive integral uh, points on the, on the sphere, the D sphere. Um, so uh, Legendre was the, was the first to give a criterion for, the, for uh, uh, when this set uh, of integral solutions is, is non-empty, and that it is non-empty precisely when D uh, um, uh, is not congruent to, to 0, 4, 7, uh, modulo 8. And uh, moreover, um, uh, because this set is actually uh, quite intimately related to a class uh, group. Hi, so Farrell. Uh, just so as to cry, have everybody participate, which is my job. Uh, uh, according to uh, Vey, actually, this really was not proved by Legendre, by the way. Uh, you should read the history, and then uh, Sarah also writes about it. It's, it seems uh, that Legendre claimed that Gauss proved it. At least that's my story. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. There will I, there will probably be many historical misattributions in this talk, um, uh, but please correct me on them. Um, so so this is this set is quite intimate related to a class group, the class group of uh, uh, the Ring of Avengers of Q uh, adjoint root uh, minus d, and uh, and this by Dirichlet is related to an L function, and by Ziegel we can bound this L function. So you, you know about the, the, the relative size of this about square root d point, uh, 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 solutions. And what we're going to do is we're going to project these solutions down to the unit sphere by dividing out by the modulus. And we're going to look at the distribution of, the, of these points as d goes to infinity along these along the allowed congruence classes. And the conjecture quite naturally is that as you go through uh, these allowed congruence classes, the um, the uh, normalized uh, sum of, har of, of, of delta masses on these points will converge weak star to the uniform measure on the sphere. Okay, there's a picture of the equidistribution. So you can see that they're quite evenly placed. Uh, um, actually, it's the real, the reality is much prettier. Um, this is a picture from uh, Ellenberg, Michel, and Lankintosh. Uh, these are the, uh, the integer points, not the primitive ones of norm uh, uh, some big number projected onto the sphere. Um, okay, and this, this problem was uh, looked at uh, uh, by Linick and his school, uh, starting with his thesis in, in 1940, and then I don't quite know exactly the publication history, but so here's the result at least. So um, if you, here's what you're gonna do, you're gonna fix uh, something which is completely unrelated to the problem. You're going to fix an auxiliary prime p odd, and you're going to re, uh, restrict the, the the allowable congruence classes by asking that the uh, d uh, uh, also verify that its its opposite is a non-zero square modulo p. This is the same thing as saying that p uh, should split in the quadratic field extension q adjoin root minus d. Um, and then Linux theorem is that is that this that you get the equidistribution that you want as long as you restrict to d uh, belonging to this um, to d of p. So um, uh, this this his, his method was sort of uh, mysterious for a long time until until modern days, uh, and uh, it is now understood that Linux condition is equivalent to a dynamical condition, uh, which is that the stabilizer of a point uh, uh, 
is uh, so so the orthogonal group and three variables uh, 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 associated to the diagonal quadratic form x squared plus y squared plus z squared acts naturally on these solutions and take the stabilizer of a point uh, 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 if d is in uh, verifies the Linux condition that's the same thing as to say that the stabilizer is split towards over qp which is which means that you have a non-compact group whose dynamics you can use and the basic idea of the ergodic method uh, is is the following you take a a weak star limit, and you want to show that it's a uniform limit. Um, there's like there are two steps. The first is Linux basic lemma, which controls nearby spacing you know, of points, and you can bootstrap, bootstrap this to show that nu has a special property relative to the, the this acting group it has maximal entropy relative to the split torus. And then you apply uh, the modern approach would be to say apply uh, a uniqueness result of Einstein Linda Strauss on the maximum on such measures. Uh, to show that it must be har. Um, an important point here is that uh, this theorem can be quantified in such a way as to dispense with this auxiliary condition, but at the price of assuming GRH. So you can actually show, you can quantify this well enough to, uh, uh, to show that the, you get weak star convergence as long as D, uh, for each D, there must exist uh, a small split prime in the field extension Q join minor minus D. And this, this set is under GRH all of the allowable congruence classes. So under GRH, you do get the theorem, which is which I want you to remember. It comes later. So uh, now on uh, the question of attribution, uh, I, I don't quite know to whom I should attribute the next theorem, uh, either to Duke or to Gulabeva Fomenko, um, which is that um, conjecture A is true with the power savings rate, uh, meaning that you can gain by, uh, that you, the speed of equity distribution is, is, is actually, um, uh, uh, you gain by a power in the speed, um, the rate. Um, okay, and, and, but this, so this is much stronger than Linux result, and, and this is done by uh, a spectral methods or automorphic methods. So you, you write down the vial sums for this equidistribution problem. So you can attest the equidistribution against test functions, uh, continuous functions on the sphere. You can assume that they're orthogonal to constants. And it's enough to test this on an orthonormal basis of L2. Um, and uh, we can choose our own orthonormal basis and we'll choose an arithmetic one. And to do that, you want to realize the sphere the arithmetically. So uh, uh, the sphere is SO3 mod SO2, and SO3 is the uh, projective units of the Hamilton, Hamiltonian quaternions. And the Hamiltonian quaternions have a Q structure, which is given by the, uh, the um, quaternion algebra ramified to an infinity. So I'll let G be the projective units of that quaternion algebra. Okay, then I'll let uh, gamma be uh, the projective units of a maximal order. I'll call that G of Z. And gamma, this is a finite group uh, of order of something like 12. Um, it acts on uh, our solutions by conjugation, and we can sort of mod out by that action, uh, taking classes, modulo gamma, and so that our test functions actually live on this uh, sphere, which is S2 mod gamma, bold, bold S2. And uh, bold S2, the bold sphere, is actually uh, can be given an, an adelic description uh, via this, this, this algebraic group G. Uh, so fixing a, a level structure, you, it's, a, it's a double quotient. Um, and uh, you can take an orthonormal basis of the sphere, which consists uh, of sphere, spherical harmonics, such that upon idealization, uh, the functions you obtain are joint eigenfunctions of the Heck algebra. This is just a fancy way of uh, describing uh, uh, the Heck operators on the sphere that were introduced by uh, Lubotsky, Phillips, Um And uh, not only that, so the next thing we want to do uh, is, is to idealize the, the vial sum itself. Uh, so this, these classes, Rd mod gamma, is a torsor for a, a certain class group. So once you fix the base point, 
you can describe the, all the points by the orbit with the principal homogeneous space. Um, and in fact, it's a torus, uh, a metallic torus integral uh, orbit. Um, so the torus is just restriction scalars from uh, your field to Q. Once you fix the solution, you get an embedding of this torus into your group. And if you fix the uh, level structures, you can describe uh, the points on bold S2 um, that you hope to show a good distribute as a, an adelic torus orbit that I'm calling Z, Z sub D. Uh, so finally, the upshot is the last slide. I can use my cursor. Uh, to, uh, the the vial sum is an, a, written now adelically uh, over an adelic torus orbit. And the reason why we do that is because, well, we want to apply tools in representation theory. Um, and so we want to apply Valsperger and, and, and other work involving like test vectors, um, which- I mean, if I may say something, uh, given that you're yeah. moving to uh, the very general setting here using all yeah. machinery, um, the difference between Duke and uh, Gobble Cuba uh, ah. is that the, for, the, for the exact problem you wrote down by some miracle, it's an easy calculation. You don't need to prove things for uh, half integral weight forms of weight three halves itself. And Ivanich did five halves and higher. So you could get by in that specific case without proving anything new. But you, this, that situation was completely unsatisfactory and you completely changed that by doing all weights and indefinite forms. So he, uh, by, uh, developing Ivanets in a much more general and mm. way. Okay. So they just quoted his theorem as stated. Right, okay. So okay. I just I to, to clarify that because often many of us give Duke credit, yeah. Yes, and I wasn't quite sure uh, why it was the case because I, we had seen this paper uh, which predated Duke, but I, we did not look carefully enough to see uh, um, that it was not exactly the statement we were looking for. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're, and these are, this is not the, the method of Duke, but um, it's not basically how we approach things nowadays using Valsperger. And so you, you vial sum the, the absolute, so the norm squares, uh, the vial sum is a, is a quotient of L functions. Um, notice that these, um, the pi, the representation pi appearing on the right-hand side will be discrete series at infinity. Uh, the denominator, uh, the, so you're only interested in the L functions which involve D since that's a parameter that's growing. In the no denominator, we understand that L function. Uh, and uh, the, the beef of this problem is to give a non-trivial upper bound on the L function in the numerator. And so all of, all of what preceded uh, this last window was sort of window dressing the real, the real beef of this problem is, is, is to establish this last subconvex sub bound. Okay, so there's a second Linux problem, uh, which was uh, which is studied uh, by Duke, uh, which involves um, uh, Hegner points. So I'll describe these in the following way. I'll take a look at the uh, primitive binary uh, quadratic forms um, of discriminant minus b uh, uh, up to uh, up to SL2 up to equivalence by SL2z. Let Y1 be the modular surface, and uh, for every uh, quadratic form in that set, uh, I will attach a, a, a unique point in, in, in the upper half plane. Uh, so, as I, so I, I should say, uh, um, I, uh, I'll take one which is in the fundamental domain uh, for, uh, for SL2Z, and this will give me um, a, a point in the modular surface. Uh, and I want to know how these uh, distribute as D goes to infinity. Uh, and uh, uh, these, these Hegner points uh, one conjectures that, uh, that as long as you go along allow discriminants, uh, that they converge uh, to the uniform measure of the um, normalized hydraulic measure of the, of the, of the modular surface. And, and Linux, Linux uh, looked at this as well, 
and solve this problem under the same condition. Namely, that you have to impose an, uh, an auxiliary condition that, that minus b minus db is square, non-zero square modulo p. And again, a quantitative version leads to conjecture b conditionally under GRH, and Duke removes that condition, giving a power savings rate by the same method. And here I'll go a little bit quicker because it's sort of the same type of thing. You realize your vial sum. Um, um, uh, first of all, the Hegner points are, uh, are once again, a, a, a torsor under a class group. Uh, so you can parameterize them once you fix a base point. Um, and you can adelicize uh, the modular curve and take a torus and an embedding. Um, and you can realize the Hegner points as a toric integral. Um, and then quote uh, the, uh, the right version of Allsperger which allows you to, to show that the, the vial sum uh, modulus squared is a, the same type of ELK function. And uh, here, the ELK function, you should keep in mind that the pi above comes from a MOS form, so at infinity, the principal series representation. And the same uh, self-convex bound of Duke Friedlander advantage solves the problem. And again, that last line is the heart of the problem, the self-convex bound. Okay. Um, so there are other variants. And just again, um, since, uh, the history of this is quite interesting and often misrepresented. Uh, the proof of Duke and Ivanich, the original proof, did not use Valsberger. It used an uh, embedding method that uh, is due to Ivanich, which is directly estimating Fourier coefficients of half integral weight without using L functions. That's right. So uh, that's right. Th this was the second proof. Exactly. Yes, this, this proof that I'm presenting is sort of the second proof. It's the proof I, I like better uh, um, using L functions. Um, okay, so um, it seems to generalize better. Um, uh, so there's, there are other versions. Uh, we, I, I could go on and on, um, and I will for a little bit. Uh, so there's sparse echo distribution. You can, these, the points that you're looking at are, are are principal homogeneous spaces under the action of a class group. So you can, you can, for example, look at large enough, uh, so, so subgroups of large enough, uh, large enough um, index in the class group, and to look at their orbits and see if these, uh, the sparse set of points also echo distributes. And for that, you'll need twisty vial sums. The numerator becomes a more complicated L function, and you'll need more advanced subconvex bounds, like uh, those by Michelle. Um, there's also the the uh, the real quadratic story, where uh, so my, my your extensions your quadratic extension is real quadratic, um, and this can be embedded into any indefinite b, uh, verifying the right uh, congruence conditions, um, so uh, splitting condition, uh, so that you obtain uh, rather than Hegner points or points in this sphere. Uh, you'll obtain packets of closed geodesics on the unit tangent bundle of a Shimura curve or, or uh, a modular curve. <coughs> uh, and, and this all follows the same pattern. So Skubanko uh, showed echo distribution of these packets of closed geodesics under Linux condition, and Duke removed these condi uh, uh, this condition and gave a power savings rate. Here's a, here's a picture, again, taken from another uh, one of the many articles on this subject uh, by uh, Anne Ziegler, Minnesota, Michelle, and Venkatesh and their collaborators. Um, okay, uh, maybe the last variation, which I'll mention, is, has a very arithmetic flavor. Um, 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 I guess I'm going through a lot of variations because I, I want to, in a sense, I want to say there are a lot of classical um, manifestations of, of one single question, which is the distribution of Adelic torus orbits. And once you specify uh, level structures and, uh, and, and splitting conditions, you can get various beautiful classical interpretations. And here's one uh, where you take a quaternion algebra, which is not uh, ramified at 2 at infinity, but at p in infinity. This has um, a, a non trivial class group, so this double quotient. Uh, uh, has, is not just a singleton anymore. 
And this double quotient is, in fact, can be identified with the isomorphism classes of super senior uh, elliptic curves over FP bar. Uh, and when I write down this identification, there's a choice involved because I've chosen um, a level structure which is coming from a, a choice of a, uh, a maximal order. Um, and if I change that level structure, the isomorphism changes, so changing the base point. Um, this has size p over 12, more or less, and has a natural probability measure, which is, which is almost uniform. You have to take into account automorphisms of your curves. Okay, uh, and the, 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 the game here is a little bit less familiar. It's certainly less familiar to me. Um, so I kind of enjoyed putting this down so I can make sure I understand it. So you take, uh, so you take a measuring quadratic field for which p is inert. Um, if you help a class field of this, uh, any P will split, uh, any rational prime will split uh, um, completely in, in, in F. And, uh, and then I look at uh, elliptic curves, which have complex multiplication by uh, ring of integers of F. Uh, these are defined over the complex, uh, sorry, over the Hilbert class field of F. So you can, you can look at their reduction modulo P. And it's a theorem of during that it, it, when you look at this reduction modulo P of the C in the elliptic curve by OF, it will have super singular reduction. So you get a map in this way. Um, and the theorem of Michel is that the fibers of this reduction map distribute according to the measure above as F varies along admissible uh, imaginary product fields. Um, so another way of saying this, saying this is the push forward measure of the natural counting measure on the elliptic curves with complex multiplication by OF. You push it forward by this reduction map and this tends to uh, the uniform measure that I've written above. And you should, this P, which is this condition P being inert in F, you should not think of that as a, an auxiliary condition. This is part of the problem. Uh, it's in the same way that when I took a definite quaternion algebra, uh, the, the, the fields uh, which I considered all had to be uh, uh, imaginary quadratic just for them to fit into the quaternion algebra. Okay. Um, oh, so finally, we're at the slide which, which, uh, which really begins what I want to talk about, which is simultaneous equidistribution. So I, I, I discuss in detail sort of all the, all the various variations of Linux problem. And now we want to observe that um, we can do something a little bit more fancy. So go back to Linux problems A and B. So I had two groups in these cases. I had G1, which is projective units of the Hamilton quaternion, and I had G2, say, which is PGL2. And for each D, uh, uh, admissible D, I get um, two embeddings one, uh, of, of, of a torus, of uh, restriction of scalars, of Q adjoined root minus D, into both G1 and G2. And so we can construct uh, diagonal maps uh, into uh, the torus into the product. Uh, and you get this diagonal cy cycle uh, of ZD into both. Uh, uh, and you know ZD equidistributes in each copy and you want to ask, does it equidistribute, equidistribute uh, in, the, in the product? And you expect it to do so because the spaces S2 and Y1 come from very different sources to non-isomorphic quaternion algebras. So that's, that's what we want to look at. And I want to now go in the opposite direction. I want to make this classical. So making this classical, I, I'm going to do this because uh, uh, using the work of um, a paper of Aka, Einziedler, and Shapira, who, who explained this beautifully. So um, I'm going to look at the modular surface in a slightly different uh, way. I'm going to look at, at, at look at it as the space of unimodular lattices in R2 up to rotation. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to give myself a, an admissible D and I'll take a, a solution, uh, to, uh, so a primitive integral solution to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the sphere of equation, uh, sphere of radius D. And for such a V, I'll look at the orthogonal lattice, lambda V. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to sort of uh, rotate it, I'm gonna rotate it up to, to a reference plane and normalize it to have co-volume one. 
And when I do those two steps, I get a, a point in L2, so the, in the modular curve. And so the, the classical description is, is, is this, and it's very nice, uh, as you run through solutions to this, to, uh, uh, to this D sphere, uh, you, pro you project, uh, simultaneously you project down to the one sphere in first coordinate, and you look at the orth orthogonal lattice in the second coordinate, and you want to know whether or not this distributes uh, in the product space. And the conjecture, this, this was raised back in, um, in, the, in the IES, uh, IES the uh, ICM uh, proceedings of Michel Venkatesh 2006, this type of problem. And it was, uh, again, conjectured uh, uh, by Aka, Einsiedler, and Shapira that this does indeed echo distribute under no supplementary conditions other than the ones that are necessary. And this theorem is very uh, similar in spirit to the Linux uh, solutions. Uh, uh, so, so here you have two copies. You're going to give yourself two distinct auxiliary primes that have nothing to do with the original problem, P and Q, distinct, odd. And then theorem is that this diagonal cycle echo disputes in the product as D goes to infinity uh, along uh, the, 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 the sequence of D, which verify a joint. Uh, um, so they have to be, the minus D has to be simultaneously a, a non-zero square and modulo P and Q, and, and maybe fundament, fundamental D, so uh, square free as well. Okay, um, so this, uh, I'm going to talk more about this uh, and also indicate the proof, but I want to, uh, um, I want to observe two, two important things is that, aspects is that there's no quantification, unlike Linux, Linux versions, uh, there's no quantification uh, available, at least for the moment. Uh, so there's no rates, even small rates, uh, and at least not enough to allow you to replace uh, th this, uh, uh, this supplementary condition by GRH. So it is not yet known uh, that this conjecture follows under GRH. So here's the idea. Um, you take a weak star, uh, a weak star limit, uh, and you show that uh, the push forward of this weak star limit uh, uh, along both projection, projections equidistributes in its copy. So this is a this is just more or less a, uh, an application of Duke Duke theorems in each individual copy. Um, so you don't you don't encounter the congruence condition at this step. At least not necessarily. Um, the second step is where you, you need it. Uh, under the limit condition, you show that this nu is invariant under uh, a ranked to torus. So uh, the stabilizer uh, 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 of the orthogonal group um, SO3, but at two places, P and Q, the two places that, that are in Linux, the limit condition. So this is a rank two uh, torus, uh, and then you apply Linden, Eisenstein, uh, Einziedler, Linden Strauss, uh, which uh, says that, so, this, so from one and two, you call this a joining. So nu is a, nu is a joining, and, and these have been classified by Einziedler and Linden Strauss, and they have to be algebraic. Um, so they have to be supported like on an algebraic subgroup of the product. And, but since G1 and G2 are distinct, there's no non-trivial algebraic subgroup containing both G1 and G2 other than the product. Um, so that's, that's their theorem. Uh, and and uh, it, although I, we, they, get, they, they, they give the theorem in this, in this very nice um, example, um, in fact, the theorem applies to all hybrid situations. For example, there's, there's this new paper on the archive, which is, very beautiful, um, and uh, and it's a hybrid, so it's a simultaneous reduction, uh, simultaneous super singular reduction of CM elliptic curves. So I have four distinct odd primes. The first two are essential to the problem, and the last latter two are uh, are auxiliary. So um, I I reduce mod P one and mod P two, and I expect the push forward of this uh, uh, the counting measure. Um, to equidistribute uh, in the product, 
as e goes to infinity, and they show that it does so as long as you, as long as the D verified E2 auxiliary, um, auxiliary congruence positions modulo, uh, uh, modulo Q1 and Q2. From so they, from what I understand, uh, if you could do two copies, you can do n copies, um, pairwise non-isomorphic copies. They certainly do so in this paper, uh, 2020 paper. Um, and it seems to be a quite a general feature. Uh, and I'm not going to mention uh, a very deep work uh, uh, by Kayutan on the mixing conjecture where you don't take uh, G1 and G2 distinct, but you take them the same. And, 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 uh, and you twist the second variable and you ask a, a more complex question and uh, you have to, uh, uh, but uh, this this was solved by Kyle uh, in 2019 um, under uh, uh, the assumption that you see there. Uh, so auxiliary congruence uh, uh, conditions and on land L zero, zero assumption. Okay, um, so now I'm finally getting to my theorem uh, and uh, uh, we had the proof and hey, once you had the proof, you had to go back and figure out what, what the statement of the theorem is. <laughs> so I, so I, I'm trying to get the theorem in the most general context that we have. Uh, um, so, um, but I want you to notice maybe the first line is that I'm, so I, I'm thinking B1 and B2 over Q, non-isomorphic, and I'm also assuming that neither one of them is a split quaternion algebra because we haven't yet, uh, figured out how to do, make our method work uh, with Eisenstein series. So both of them are non-split. So in particular, nothing that I say from now on will apply to the, to the, um, uh, the, the nice uh, case that, that Aka, Eitzinler, and Shapira wrote down, but I hope that we'll re resolve this soon. So you take B1 and B2 non-isomorphic, and you, you look at their uh, uh, projective unit groups, and I'll just call G their product. So I'm gonna be looking at the equation division in G. And I'll have some level structure, which I'm taking to be an Eichler order, given by Eichler orders. Um, uh, and I'll take projective units of these Eichler orders in each copy, and I take their product. That will give me my level structure in the product. K infinity is SO2 twice, and X is uh, the product uh, curve. And now, uh, now, that I, now I'm gonna look at uh, Tori, uh, which uh, are given by field ex quadratic field extensions. And I can take uh, imaginary or real quadratic field extensions, uh, uh, discriminant D, optimally embedded into um, my, uh, 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 um, my OI. Um, and from this, I, from this choice of optimal embedding, I get an, a diagonal embedding from TD into G. So this diagonal inclusion. Uh, I conjugate the uh, K infinity to make it equal to um, the real points of T. And I get this diagonal cycle, um, which you can write adelically in this way. But it's, uh, so this is the adelic way of writing, say the classical situation uh, of Aka and Caesar and Shapira. And our theorem um, is, is the following. So the principal assumption is GRH. And under GRH, uh, you get equidistribution with a, with a logarithmic rate. Okay, and, and our, our proof goes through the theory of automorphic forms and Vols for J theorem um, in, 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 in a style very much reminiscent uh, of the one. Yeah. Uh, Farrell, since there's a little discussion going on the side, this is just for two factors, ah. right? So I haven't been, been looking at the... Um, uh, uh, at, no, 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 you don't have to look. Yeah, I'm asking yeah, you a question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, yeah, thank you. You thank can't you. do more than two factors. We cannot. So, so you know, I, I... No, we cannot. I had a, one, I had a glimmer of hope at one point. Uh, I, because maybe I can... Not, uh, we can discuss it at the to mention it. So, so the, f the fact is that, like, I mean, if you look at the end copies uh, proof, I mean, you basically bootstrap it from two copies. As long as you have it for two copies, you can get it for N. 
And we can do two copies uh, under GRH. Um, and uh, and and I I asked Manfred uh, if uh, if if you have two copies under GRH as we do, can the can can you apply the joining theorem to uh, to get n copies? And I, he pointed out that I mean you don't have a joining, you don't know that it's a joining. Um, so so my my first my first thought was maybe the spectral approach, which I'm going to show you. Once you have a spectral approach for two copies, maybe you can employ a dynamic approach to go from uh, right. two to n. Uh, but that, 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 we, that we cannot do. But, but purely spectrally, I, I, I don't have an, any idea for how to go from more than two copies. OK, so that's the point, And that's where the Riemann hypothesis uh, is probably at square root. Well, we'll wait and see. OK, so, uh, so uh, I think I'm doing reasonably well on time. Uh, so this is what I plan to do now. Uh, I plan to describe a previous approach to this problem by Ru Zheng Zheng, give some motivation to what we're doing and then sketch our proof. Okay, so, uh, so the, originally there's an appendix to, um, to this paper by Aka Einziler Shapira by Ru Zheng Zheng, in which he, so you, you want to, you want to remove these auxiliary congruence conditions by working spectrally, automorphically, so you have to identify the vial sum. And, uh, and so maybe there's not a unique way to identify the vial sum spectrally. So the way that Eugene Zheng discovered was that you can, uh, so let me, so here's a, here's, a, here's a vial sum for the AES variant, Aka Einziedler Shapira. So I have a sphere and I have the modular surface, I think a spherical harmonic on one copy and a mass form on the other, so omega and a phi, and I write down my vial sum. And 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 uh, Zheng Zheng showed that this uh, you can realize this vial sum in the following way: construct a, an SL3 to go higher rank, um, SL3 Eisenstein series induced by uh, um, um, a, a maximal parabolic, so of size two one block decomposition two one, wh where you put a where you put phi the mass form on the on the two by two block. Uh, maybe a, a, the S character on the one block, and then you have it have K type governed by the spherical harmonic omega. So, you, th so that's what you get when you, when you write down this, this sum. This is nice insight series for SL3Z. And if you evaluate it at the identity, you get a Dirichlet series and you can sort of, and, and, and whose coefficients are the vial sums you're interested in. And so you want to sort of uh, see if you can juice anything out of that. Um, th th maybe some remarks. First of all, it's not clear from this description because once we sort of, once Valentin and I, uh, because this work, although I didn't mention it, this is joint with Valentin Blomer, um, we of course wanted to see whether or not GRH would, um, because honestly, GRH is maybe not a, some, uh, at the beginning, maybe you're not thinking that. That you want to uh, uh, assume GRH because, after all, in the one variable problem, if you assume GRH, I mean, all you need is subconvexity. You don't want to you don't want to solve the problem under GRH because you're much better than subconvexity. Um, but it's not certainly not clear how GRH would imply non-trivial balance on these. these. That's the whole game, um, in fact. Um, and I I have to say, in retrospect, it, it seems to be situation. It seems to be structurally similar to uh, a result by uh, Giannis, who's here with us, uh, uh, Riziger and, and, and Nicole Roth, which where they showed QUE for half integral. Why Eisenstein series? It, it, should it, bound, it follows from bounds and coefficients of a double theory like series. Uh, and and so what Rujain was was able to show was that on average uh, you have some upper bound, but this upper bound is just not. Uh, first of all, there could be cancellation in this sum. These are not. It's not absolute value, absolute values. Uh, this could be cancellation, um, which is um, giving you this, which is accounting for this upper bound. You, it, it, it doesn't give you pointwise. Doesn't, it doesn't give you pointwise upper bounds. And um, uh, no, I mean, yeah. So it's just, it's just not enough to give you much. Uh, certainly not enough to, 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 to shed any light on that, uh, spectrally on the problem. So. Um, so we decided to do something else. Um, uh, 
which is uh, more in the line of, line of L functions. Uh, and uh, the first thing to remark is that um, each individual inclusion of the torus into its copy is what's called a, a strong Gelfand pair. So you take any, uh, um, if, if you look at the, uh, the home dimension of the Hom space between any uh, irreducible and miscible representation of the piatic group uh, and, and, and chi p, a character, the torus, it's, a, it's at most one. Whether it's one or zero sort of is a deep question using uh, having to do with epsilon factors. Um, and uh, it's called the multiplicity, multiplicity one result and it lies at the heart of Valtzer's formula. Um, and, and when you have this type of result, um, the torque period is, is often related to a single L function. But we no longer have this strong Gelfan pair for this diagonal copy of the torus inside the product. But what we do have, uh, it has a special name, uh, it's called Gelfand formation. So uh, although, although the um, diagonal copy is, is thin within the, di the diagonal, sorry, although the diagonal copy is thin within the product, G1 cross G2, uh, you can put an intermediate layer into this inclusion which is diagonal in, embedded into the product of the two tori, embedded in the product of the two groups. Uh, and at each layer of this power, it, it's a Gelfand pair. Uh, and this is called a Gelfand formation, at least by, uh, by Andrei Reznikov uh, in, in, in uh, his papers. And when, when you have a Gelfand formation, you expect that uh, the period not to be related to an, a single L function, but a family of L functions. Um, so let's see this in action. Uh, so I'm going to, for the rest of the talk, uh, just take my FD. I can take it if I want to be real quadratic, but it's a little bit more complicated. Let me take it to be imaginary quadratic. There I know what the, how, how, how the class group is. Uh, and the vial sum, I will, so if you remember my F1 and F2, those are my classical uh, functions and I idealize them by phi i. Okay, and so the right-hand side is sort of the adelic uh, inner product over uh, the class group. Um, and our main estimate is that this vial sum decays logarithmically. Um, um, and uh, so I, I'm gonna view this inner product, I'm gonna view this as an inner product of the class group and I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply Planchorel. Uh, and this will give me um, a, a sum over the characters of the class group of twisted uh, twisted um, vial sums by chi, class group character. So this, the, we, we, we did this a long time ago and didn't know what to do with it. Um, so um, heuristically, well, uh, there are about, so you don't need GRH for the first thing. Uh, there are about uh, square root D terms in the sum. And then under GRH, you might expect, and I'll say why, uh, that each term is about d to the minus one half. Uh, and uh, so you need to win somehow, um, but you might hope for cancellation, um, which, which is okay between the two, um, which uh, in the end would give you, like you might conjecture that this would be at size at most, more or less d to the minus one quarter. Um, but there's really no way to access this type of information. Neither, neither the, uh, the first one nor the second one. Um, so the first step we're, step we're gonna do is very crazy. Um, it, it will seem less crazy uh, based on experience from the last 10 years, um, but uh, uh, if, if, if before Hololinsky, this would certainly not been, uh, it would have been a very surprising thing to do. Uh, we're just gonna avoid all cancellation. Um, and um, and uh, we're going to assume that, uh, of course, we we can we, we can allow ourselves to assume that this uh, that the terms in, in the sum are non-zero. And the, a twist of Alsperger formula gives you uh, uh, a formula for the square period, um, um, which means uh, when you insert this, that you will convert it into uh, so the sum will be upper bounded by uh, I'll use my cursor, 
LD of one. So one, I, I highlight because it's L functions at one. So under, under GRH, L functions at one, uh, well, this is only, so you're only looking at the D, the D, the D uh, um, direction. So it's really the first one you're looking at and that's log log growth. Or, uh, um, so that, that's not gonna hurt you. And, uh, and then you insert this, you get a fractional moment of, of L functions over the class group. Um, okay, and now since pi one is not equal to pi two, uh, uh, no, so since G one is not equal to G two, uh, you can show that pi one is not equal to pi two. Okay, uh, so for, let me, I, I, let me say a couple words on this um, because uh, I think it deserves some explanation. Um, so if you remember in the AES example, I had uh, um, a, the sphere and, uh, and a modular curve. And at infinity, uh, we got a discrete series and uh, mass form, uh, principal series. So it's clear that they're not going to be, pi one and pi two in that case will not be equal. Um, you can sort of play around with, uh, uh, with level structures in a way which ensures you that the image uh, under Jockey Langland, because all this is sort of, I'm going from my quaternion algebra to Jockey Langland, uh, through Jockey Langland to GL2, PGL2. Um, you can, you can um, concoct level structure uh, in, incompatible level structures in such a way that uh, you, you guarantee that the P1, pi one and pi two are non-isomorphic. Um, but in general, uh, my understanding my understanding is that you can have um, uh, pi's which come from two different quaternion algebras under Jacques Langlands correspondence. So you have to be you have to uh, think about how you have to how you might uh, eliminate that and um, I haven't quite thought it all the way through, but my understanding is that um, if you uh, uh, if, if if your if your basis consists of what you might call uh, toric new forms, you there you you um, as long as as long as the uh, the periods are non-zero, uh, they, they can only come from one quaternion algebra. And so one, one pi, one, uh, any given pi does not have two different pre-images under Jockey Langlands. So my, uh, I, I don't think we, we haven't really worked this out yet. Uh, up, to, up until now, we've sort of been imposing in, incompatible level structures to guarantee this pi one not equal to pi two, but I think it's, well, I, I, I think it's automatic um, just by the non-vanishing of the period. But um, I, I, we haven't had, we haven't worked that out to be honest, um, but but I do think it holds. Um, and, and so now we want we want to um, we've re we've reduced it to this last estimate that we want. So we haven't really started yet. So how are we going to do this? Um, first of all, pointwise GRH fails, as it must, because if you're going to do this pointwise, you're not going to see the fact that I have two different quaternion algebras. Uh, so um, I mean, I can go through this, but you should, you should believe automatically that, that it won't work. Um, I mean, the, first of all, the bounds, uh, you don't even have O of one bounds on, on the central values of your, of your, of your um, L functions. Um, I, I won't dwell on, on this, but so, so GRH applied to each factor simply does not it would, that would be a boring proof. If you got to this point, um, it would be quite a boring proof. If, okay, now you just apply, uh, apply GRH. But, but of course that cannot work in any case because if it worked here, it would also apply to the, to the uh, mixing case in the sense that we have G1 equal to G2. Okay, this is a structurally similar situation to unipotent coefficients. This QUE, uh, a resolution of QUE, a QUE. Um, so we have two works on this now. Um, the first one was, the big breakthrough was by Holowinski for holomorphic modular forms, uh, um, uh, using um, the multiplicativity of the coefficients uh, in particular, um, showing that uh, this, this uh, shifted convolution sum for uh, uh, unipotent coefficients, uh, heck eigenvalues, um, um, 
in a in a in a dyadic interval, which is uh, basically the same as the spectral parameter of your moss swarm. That um, so uh, uh, that you have some decay, so this logarithmically, so that these coefficients. I'm up here still. Um, these coefficients, are, on average, are the, are small um, and independently on sh small shifts. So Sato Sato Tate will will indicate that they're not always concentrated along the edge, um, and uh, and you have the like you have a, you have O of one you have small O of one for just for the absolute values. So Rankin Selberg says the absolute value square um, is going to be a uh, constant size, and but just the absolute values would be small O of one. So it should be non-dihedral then. Yes. Precisely for the reason that Sada Tate makes. Mm. Thank you. Um, and then really the thing that, I mean, it just caught our eyes. I mean, you can see it. Um, this is just basically what we have in front of us in any case. Uh, this is a half integral a mass form QUE for, uh, solved by Lester Raziwill on GRH. So they don't have multiplicativity, multiplicativity, uh, multiplicativity of these coefficients. These coefficients are actually unipotent coefficients of half integral mass, mass, mass forms, um, which uh, can be related to central values by uh, a version of Valsberger, which is explicated by uh, um, uh, Katak and, and, and Sarnak. Um, so it's the same, and, and, and uh, similar situation is, similar story is true. I mean, um, the, the first moment without the square root, so I'm gonna look at the individual factor here. This first moment without the square root is, is constant size. Uh, put a square root, this fractional moment is a small O of one, which is proved by uh, uh, Maxime and, and sound. Um, and, and that sort of tells you that on average it's going to be uh, small, and you have to make sure that it's sort of independent, independently small. And this is this is related to another type of Galfand-like formation. It's not quite a Galfand formation, but close to it. Where instead of T, you have N, the unipotent uh, so, uh, upper triangular matrices. Okay, so. Uh, doing reasonably well on time. I have a few more slides and just to give you the proof. So um, so the proof is kind of, you have to put yourself in a probabilistic number theory type of mindset. Um, um, so let me look at these uh, events, uh, the central values as events. So the um, um, and so L1 and L2, um, and I view them as independent Gaussian random va variables in chi. Uh, I mean, heuristically at least, um, and I put L of chi to be their product. That's what we are really interested in. Um, I'm going to denote by mu and sigma squared the expectation and variance of this of this uh, random variable in chi, and it will be the it will be the, the the mu will be the sum, sorry, the average of the uh, of the uh, expectations of each individual one. And the naive variance will be uh, uh, the, the, the naive uh, standard deviation. The, the naive standard deviation, deviation will be also uh, half of each one. So you get divided by four. You take the, the square. Okay. Uh, I put naive because it will need to be corrected later. Um, um, and then um, so the, the the point is that you can calculate these variances and expectations under GRH because uh, the L function under GRH um, it can be approximated uh, by so, so the L function to the right of the critical strip is equal to its directly series expansion but under GRH some form of that is also true um, um, and so you can you can upper bound, for example, the uh, each individual logarithmic L function by some short sum of of uh, <coughs> dir uh, sh short Dirichlet uh, sum 
so I have, I have what I have. I have um, p at the x at the uh, coefficient of pi i. Uh, pi, pi is fixed. I'm really looking at the, the variation with chi. And a chi is the coefficient of, of the um, of the sort of the theta series induced from chi down to down to q. Um, very simple to write that down. I just didn't write, write it down for lack of space. And then the second term is um, this, now I, I'm going up to p, p squared up to x under for for split primes, um, and I get the, the p squared terms. And the inert primes actually can be um, uh, uh, can be evaluated is actually in, independent of chi. Can you evaluate this independently of chi? And I write it as mu i. It's simply the, it's simply the expectation uh, of mu i. So the mu i is the, the mu i is the, the contribution from the inert primes. And the other so the, those first two sums are, are the only two which actually depend on chi. Um, and you can so their mean is certainly zero just by orthogonality of characters. Um, but uh, I guess the thing I want to just to to say is that the important feature is that once you once you run this this heuristic, um, you can calculate the exponential of mu plus uh, variance over two to be the bound that we're hoping to show. So in a sense, I want to show you that I want to arrive at this, this quantity here. And if I can arrive in my estimations at this quantity here, I'll be done. I just have two steps, uh, two, two, two pages and uh, two slides and I'll be done. Uh, some standard manipulations in um, analytic number theory to start. So by partial summation, I can write my, um, um, my joint vial sum. This is my, this is my fractional moment. Um, in this way, where I'm, I'm picking out uh, how many times chi, how many times, uh, how often this random variables, I'm looking at the tail, the tails of these, this random va variable. Um, and I'll, I'll recenter it. So I really want to see how, when is it, when it, how often is it a, a larger than the mean? So that's, that's my N of V. Uh, and then I'm going to apply uh, um, um, some sort of Markov inequality for higher moments. Uh, so uh, for any k, I can bound the thing I'm interested in by by this two k moment uh, of this uh, difference. Um, and if you, I, our interest is. Our interest is in taking k large. I mean, if k is zero, for example, you've killed all information. Uh, k is, is, is still true when k is equal to zero, but it gives you, I've killed everything. So really my interest is, is to take k large. Um, and I want to bound this latter thing now. I, so the, the method boils down to estimating moments of logarithmic L functions. Um, and you can do this. Uh, uh, it's non-trivial, but uh, orthogonal, basically the central ingredient here is orthogonality of characters. For k large enough, um, you, can, you can obtain the following upper bound, um, where I have, I've had the correct uh, sigma two to involve an, ex uh, an extra term. So it's not the naive variance anymore, but it's, it's the true variance in this problem, which is corrected by correlation between pi one and pi two. Um, um, so this, this correlation is well-defined because pi one is different from, from pi two. So the, he, we're really picking up uh, the fact that pi one is different from pi two just by the fact that L function at one is well-defined. Um, and we're also um, cuspidal, it also plays a role um, in this because I've assumed that uh, we have uh, non-split quaternion algebra. So everything is cuspidal. Okay, and then I think I, I'm basically done. Uh, I'm almost there, here we go. Uh, then you, then you, you, insert it, you insert everything, uh, you, you insert your moment estimate and you get uh, an upper bound on N of V by correctly choosing K. And then finally, when you insert everything back into its place, 
you do get what we are hoping to find, which is the exponential of mu plus one half the standard uh, the variance, um, which is log d to the minus one fourth. And all this goes back to an approach by sound on moments of the Riemann zeta function. And I'm all done. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, are there any questions? I guess maybe there's um, some questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I wasn't looking. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's by... uh, you can ask in the meantime while you look at the chat. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, a beautiful lecture, beautiful result. Um, let me ask this. Uh, do we know for sure that the vial sum for the joint just for two is not some period formula of a Boucheret Bushera type for Ziegel type L function. This was mm -hmm. what uh, this is how Rao Jing Zhang got involved in that in interpreting mm -hmm. the vial sum as an Eisenstein series. But uh, what he was looking for, and it wasn't clear to me, I don't understand the periods sufficiently well. Are we sure that this isn't a period and that it would be some other L function for which that complexity would give it? Do we know that? <laughs> No, I mean, uh, it's something I will, we will think about, but um, it's not something we thought about in, until now. So what you're seeing is new to me. Um, so some of um, these uh, gross Prasad people who know these conjectures accurately might know better. Yeah. Uh, when we were looking then, it wasn't clear. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's very unlikely to be a, the L function, it might be expressed as another period on a different group. Uh, but not I individually, not one. So it wouldn't be a clean, uh, so to speak, I where you just applied Lindelof directly. Because Right, uh, I think it, it wouldn't be an L function. I think that, uh, that seems very, um, we would have noticed okay. that. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think you can prove in a certain way that there's not an L function formula. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, I mean, not to like bring everything possible to the function field example, but like you know, a certain case of this that we understand well in the function field, then you can like see how it varies with like different looking at different shifts in the class group, and you can just see that that's not a behavior that any L function has. So like it has some somehow different geometric behavior than L functions. So there can't be even like a really well hit an L function formula. From, from the chat, I uh, understood you can prove in the function field the analog of this. Well, in, in, in one very special case, you, you can do this, but it's somehow a different case than the case, um, like the, the case of two Swift, so, so Swift primes, the case where the dynamical methods work. Um, but it's like, it has to be specifically a specific function, it has to be specifically GL2, and sort of you only get Eisenstein series terms because there's no class formula in this case. This is the work of, of Shenda and Zimmerman, and then some additional stuff building off of it. So you can, you can do this sort of different direction. Um, but like, well, yeah, one of the things you can see by this is you can see, I th yeah, you can see that it, it sort of differs in a, in a key way from, from being just a single L function value. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, Farrell, I also have a question. Um, good talk. I, I was wondering if you could kind of expand upon the the obstacle for Eisenstein series. So ah. I'm guessing if something goes wrong with the variance when you correct from naive, you get a pole in the L function or something, or? Yeah, so uh, um, maybe there are two ways to say this, I think. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, this L function uh, is not, which corrects, I mean, if you just try to, you know, do everything formally up until the last, and up, in, up until it breaks, um, it will break, at, if not before, it will certainly break when you, when you, when, when proving this uh, upper bound on the moments. 
Um, uh, and and I think so. Oh, so this is what we think. So um, so if you just if you if you just do Eisenstein series um, and not a packet, uh, um, then it's that's where I think the reason is because you you have to take a you have to take a packet. You have to take um, what are these called uh, incomplete Eisenstein series. But if you, if you just do it with pack uh, with with a with single Eisenstein series, then like um, even just the the like the moment. So so uh, God, how does this work? Um, if you you want to apply the Hecke period, not Boltzmann, um, and heuristically the Hecke period over 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 uh, uh, the moment, also over uh, just the first moment over the class group, that will decay. So that's fine. Like, but the fact is we have to take absolute values. So we, we, we would be looking at um, the absolute value of, uh, of the heck of period averaged over, uh, over the class group characters. And that, uh, at least heuristically, uh, is, um, does not decay, uh, at least for uh, uh, um, for a single Eisenstein series. But if you take a packet, uh, uh, so an incomplete Eisenstein series, then we think we can make this work because uh, there are basically we saw we saw some papers which seemed to be relevant, uh, um, mainly by Mark Munch, Munch rather. Um, who seems to develop the the the, uh, the sound uh, this, this moment method of sound for um, for incomplete Eisenstein series um, and it, 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 so I I think there's something in the literature there that we can sort of uh, borrow from for for that case but it de definitely you have to I mean just a small you, you, it seems like you do have to take an incomplete Eisenstein series but, but yeah I hope I hope that that will be I, I I I hope that we'll be able to do that soon, rather than having it treated somewhere else. So. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again.